Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello, everybody. Uh, As you know, we are on tour. Yep. Uh, As we record this intro, we are actually on a quick break between two legs of our autumn tour. And today we are sharing a live show that we recorded recently in Chicago at Park West. We had an amazing time in the Windy City and the audience and the venue were both spectacular. So here we go. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I am Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. You guys are so cute. How cute is Uh, Okay, so if you look at old photographs, which we all have done at some point in time, they all look a little ghosty and magical and ethereal, uh, but that is because they're old. (laughs) Uh, The technology used to create them wasn't as advanced as what we have now, obviously, and they have aged. But almost since French inventor Nicephore Niepce uh, started experimenting in the 18-teens and 1820s that far back with Bitumen of Judea to create... Uh, heliographs, basically they were like sun-developed images, people started thinking about the possibility of whether or not a camera could capture the supernatural, that which could not be seen with the naked eye, but which a lot of people believed was there. And of course today, if you look online for like a quick Google of ghost pictures, you will see a kajillion of them. You'll even see tutorials on how to make your own ghost pictures that are very, very convincing. Um, But then there are a lot that people think are real, and whether or not that's the case is a whole matter of debate that I don't need to wade into. Um, You believe what you believe. That's cool. Um, But tonight, we're going to talk about a man who similarly continues to be debated as to whether or not he was legitimate or not in this area. Uh, There are people who say that his work was definitely the real deal, and others who point out a lot of the problems, which we will talk about, (laughs) some of which are, in my opinion, hilarious. Uh, But first, I want to set the stage about some of the ways that people have wanted, really genuinely wanted to actually capture the unseen photographically. And so we're first gonna start with a brief story about the man who actually inspired this episode, and I wanted to do an episode all about him, but there just isn't really enough material. Uh, But he is worth mentioning because he's fascinating. He thought he was onto something super groundbreaking, which was the photography of thoughts, and that man was Louis Darger. So Louis Darger was born in 1847. He was a military man and rose up through the ranks of the French military to become a commandant. What he is most known for, as Holly just said, is trying to take pictures of thoughts. And in 1911, Darger wrote, quote, when the human soul produces a thought, it sends vibrations through the brain. The phosphorus it contains starts radiating and the rays are projected out. By that point, he had actually been working in this area of study for about 15 years. And his inspiration to start in this field was the work that eventually led Wilhelm Röntgen to discover X-rays in 1895. It was kind of like two similar ideas that branched out. So X-rays were happening, they were in development, and he started to think, hey, if we could photograph the inside of someone's body, why couldn't we maybe photograph pictures of what is inside the human mind. It is such a cool idea. It is. It requires a creativity that I sort of love. Yeah, and Darje wanted so badly to capture these radiating phosphorus thought rays that he developed a mechanism that he sincerely believed could do exactly that as the thoughts exited the human head. And this was a pretty simple apparatus. It was a strap that went around the head and it had an attachment for a photographic plate. And the subject would wear this portable radiographer, and the images that appeared in the photograph would be interpreted by Darje. So last night, it occurred to me as we were doing this, and I gave that audience this idea, and I also give to you, if you want to go really esoteric with your Halloween costume this year, (laughs) just strap a photographic plate to your head and be a Louis Darje experiment. No one will get it. You'll be that jerk at the party that's explaining your esoteric (laughs) costume over and over. But it might be fun. When you find that person who's like, this is amazing, just marry them. It'll be great. (laughs) Be perfect. Um, But here's the thing. Tracy mentioned that these these thought photos were interpreted by Darje. And the interpretation aspect of the whole thing had its own poetry. Um, At one point, he asked his wife to hold a photographic plate in front of her forehead to capture her thoughts. 
she was a good sport, but she allegedly dozed off in this little experiment. <laughs> um, and when Darje developed this plate, he was absolutely convinced that the image that it had captured was that of an eagle. And he actually notated this picture, Photographie du rêve l'aigle, which translates to photo of dream, the eagle. But Madame Darje was always very frank that she did not recall dreaming of an eagle, or any bird for that matter. Another Darje photo was produced um, when the subject, referred to as Monsieur H, wore the portable radiographer while playing the piano. And Darje believed that the resulting image was a portrait of Beethoven. And this interpretation requires some creativity because the image is a series of blurs. And then the diamond-shaped area that Darje outlined as Beethoven's image is like just a slightly sharper series of blurs. <laughs> it is the longest walk to get to that looking like a picture. I'm like, bless your heart, Louis Darje. <laughs> um, but to be clear, as kooky as this all sounds to us, there were plenty of people who really thought that the work that Darje was doing had a lot of merit and should be explored further. And part of the reason that they were so very convinced was the way that Darje talked about this work. It was in very scientific terms. That quote that we read earlier, uh, you know, he referred to things radiating out and projecting and rays. In his mind, he was not talking about something supernatural or anything hocus pocusy. He really thought that this work was scientific, and he borrowed from the parlance surrounding the work that was going on with x-rays. So there was a scientific explanation for the creation of these photos, but it was not that he was rendering human thoughts. He was rendering body heat. <laughs> And then the photo developing was also pretty amateur. So Darje's assertion was that he was capturing thought and images and that was debunked using a corpse. Because initially, well, initially it seemed like this whole corpse exper experiment proved that Darje's work was legitimate because when they put the portable radiographer on the corpse, no image was produced because corpses don't think. <laughs> um, but when they warmed up the corpse, uh, lo and behold, the warm corpse produced some thought photos. I am so curious how they warmed up the corpse. <laughs> I have this really, really ridiculous cartoon in my head that involves a human-sized chafing dish. <laughs> I mean, they were French, right? That seems right. Um... <laughs> I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't find anything that said how they heated those corpses up. Uh, but those experiments that were conducted with the corpse were done by the French Academy of Arts and Sciences. And they took hold of this whole thing because uh, Darje had been writing to them to explain his work and what he really thought was a scientific breakthrough. And some writings about this whole event kind of frame this as like revealing a fraud and that, you know, they, they, pointed out that Darje was a complete faker. But really, Louis Darje was a believer. He was not a con man. He did not intend to deceive anybody. He was just really, really wrong about what was going on <laughs> with his photos. His work does live on, though. The J. Paul Getty Museum has nine Darje photos in the collection, including his wife's dream eagle. Uh, some of these images have basic drawings on them. Sort of like you might like draw what the constellation is supposed to look like to point the viewer to what Darje believed was the important part of the photo. So one looks like an image of a cane and two are what he perceived as bottles, one grand and one petite. And there is also a photo in that group uh, at the Getty that suggests that in a way Darje was on to what was actually happening with these image, images, but he just didn't quite connect the dots. There's one that's titled Inferior Plate, Light and Not Heat. And it is a really blobby mess of blurs. And his note kind of hints that he knew that heat was involved, but he didn't realize that body heat was the entire thing. Yeah, it wasn't heat and thought, so that was just the whole deal. <laughs> Uh, still, though, there were and are people who work in this area and believe that Darje was actually on to something. He's sometimes referred to as the father of thought photography and the experiments that he was doing. Uh, there were exper experiments that were inspired by the work that he was doing, and that went on for decades. Yeah, even today, there are people still trying to figure out if we can 
capture what's going on in the, the human brain and render an image. It's a little less um, about sort of the ethereal and legitimately scientific and not just borrowing scientific words. But the important thing here is that Darje was, by all accounts, entirely earnest in his belief that he was capturing the invisible. We kind of said, as we started his story, that we were using this as a contrast because he had no desire whatsoever to deceive. And that contrast is against the next man that we are gonna talk about, William Mumler, who was doing his work, which was in spirit photography, decades before Darje actually. And whether Mumler was earnest himself or was just fleecing people is a trickier question that continues to be debated in part because even while evidence mounted against him and that he might be doing something dicey, he always, unfailingly, with absolutely no waiver, professed his innocence. Yeah. So William Howard Mumler was the big name in spirit photography and a man who made a lot of money doing it. He was born in 1832, and then there's not a lot of information readily available about his early life or his education. But by the time he was in his mid-20s, he had settled into this nice career as a professional engraver at Bigelow Brothers and Kennard in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, this was an import and sales business that dealt in, quote, watches, clocks, rich jewelry, silver, silver-plated and fine hardware goods, ivory, table cutlery, Geneva musical boxes, watchmakers' tools, files, and materials, per their advertising. It was a very focused business. <laughs> Um, he had a lot of stuff to engrave, though. It kept him busy, and he was really re well respected in this regard. And the start of Mumler's spirit photography was accidental, allegedly. He was interested in this still new field of photography in the early 1860s. That was just a little more than 20 years after Louis Daguerre introduced the daguerreotype uh, camera. And in 1861, Mumler started learning how to make wet plate photography at a, a studio that was the Mrs. H. F. Stewart Photographic Gallery. And in his hobbyist work, when he was alone in the studio one afternoon, he took what he intended to be a self-portrait. That picture changed his life. Yeah, because when the photo was developed, it looked like there was a girl in it with him, and she looked very ethereal, as though she was made of light. And there are two different versions of how Mumler perceived this event uh, depending on the source that you read, you might read two do totally different versions. So one is that Mumler claimed that he believed that this image was that of his dead cousin who had been uh, deceased for, I think it was 12 years, but some time. And he marveled in this version at having caught a spirit with his camera and he started to show people this photo. But the other version is that Mumler immediately thought that because he was a novice photographer, he had somehow messed up and he had used a plate that had already been exposed. And then he was just showing it to friends as an example of what a bumbler that he was in the, the developing um, space. So in this version, it is a spiritualist friend of his who took that photo public, claiming that it was a, a real picture of a ghost. And that second version, is the one that Mumler relayed in his autobiography. And it is very convenient because it very carefully makes him in no way responsible for the claim that this was an image of a spirit. Yeah, then either, either way, regardless of which of those versions was the real one, the photo was soon written up in two prominent spiritualist periodicals, New York's The Herald of Progress and Boston's The Banner of Light. Mumler wrote later on that he was mortified by the attention that this whole thing was bringing to him, but then it just kept happening when he took more pictures. Uh, then he started to think that it was not the error of an amateur photographer, but an actual spiritual phenomenon. Again, that is the version he told of this story years and years later. So for spiritualists, this picture was huge. This was cited as an instance of absolute proof that spiritualism was scientifically grounded. And Mumler, it seemed, had validated the entire movement with this one image. And as a consequence, to put it quite plainly, he blew up. He was an overnight sensation. So this was right in the middle of the Victorian era. Spiritualism was all the rage. There was just a deep fascination with the idea of maintaining some kind of tie or communication with the dead. Abraham Lincoln was president at the time, and his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, was an ardent spiritualist. Additionally, there was all kinds of technology developing that showed that sometimes mechanical things like telegraphs could capture information in a way that humans could not do on their own. This was really exactly the right time culturally for people to just buy into this whole idea of ghosts appearing on film. 
And of course, I mean, this is not uh, specific just to this era in time. Anytime someone comes up with something cool, everybody else wants it, right? That's how it works. And plenty of people were ready and willing to give William Mumler money to take pictures of their deceased loved ones. So in addition to the interest in spiritualism, part of the driver was that this was also a time when a lot of people were losing loved ones on the battlefields of the US Civil War. So those sudden losses made families really long for any sort of connection to or memento of the dead. So William Memler stopped working as an engraver and transitioned to working full-time at the Stewart studio making these portraits. He charged as much as $10 for a portrait at a time when getting a photo that did not have spirits in it cost 25 cents. Uh, and Bang. then Yeah. <laughs> he charged this sitting fee regardless of whether a spirit decided to appear in the picture or not, because sometimes they didn't want to. Uh, his business was really booming. Yeah, I uh, I like the idea that sometimes the spirit's like, nah. I don't like that guy. I feel I've I've I don't feel my best today. I know I'm feeling a little puffy. I, I got two hours of sleep. Um, <laughs> so the client, oh, excuse me, the client would come in for a sitting, and then they would pose perfectly still for a minute to have their photo taken, and then after that photo was developed they would have an image of not only themselves, but also their dead loved one, usually just behind them or just to the side. Hopefully, that's what they wanted. <laughs> this whole thing was so successful that William Mumler also started a mail order business. Clients could mail him $7.50, along with a detailed description of their dead loved one, and then Mumler would commune with the spirits photographically and then mail the photo to them after processing. Those ones, of course, only contain the spirits, not anyone else. Uh, I am also very curious about, um, like, what, like, if he, if somebody said, hey, when you're communing with these spirits photographically, what are you doing exactly? What he would have had as that answer. He would just say, like, I just take the picture. They show up or not. Yeah. He put it all on the spirits. He was very not about responsibility. <laughs> It's really up to your Nana if she wants to come and be in the picture or not. Um, so in the midst of his growing interest in photography as all of this was playing out, Mumler had also taken an interest in the receptionist at Mrs. Stewart's studio, whose name was Hannah. And Hannah was a medium. And she had been a medium since she was a child. She was well known in the spiritualist community of Boston as being very gifted in this regard. And William and Hannah were married, and Mrs. Mumler soon became part of the spirit portrait experience for their patrons. So while customers were spending that full minute sitting in front of Mumler's camera, Hannah would tell them all about the spirits that she could see around them. Sometimes she would lay hands on the camera, acting as sort of a conduit for the spirits to make their way into the image. Mumler also started to bill himself as a medium along, alongside her, claiming that his work as a photographer had connected him to the spirit world. I want to know so much more about Hannah because she's always described sort of as like almost a 1920s starlet, kind of like strolling in, maybe a little sleepy looking and like, I'm feeling it, I'm really feeling it. Like she really had like the whole jam down. She was good. Uh, so Mumler's business was going fantastically at this point, but... Trouble was on the horizon. And we're going to talk about that, but first we are going to pause for a little sponsor break. So photography, as we mentioned, was an industry at this point that was still in its infancy. So for a newcomer to the scene who was very open that he was really something of an amateur to be doing booming business in a niche area using a mystery technique that no other photographer was able to achieve, that attracted a lot of attention. Uh, so much so that skeptics, some of whom were photographers themselves, started hiring investigators to visit Mumler and see if they could figure out exactly what it was he was doing. Yeah, so in 1862, James Wallace Black took an interest in Mumler's work. Black himself was also a photographer. He had actually forged some new paths, although they had nothing to do with spiritualism. He had traveled in a hydrogen balloon in 1860, which... Glad that went okay. Uh, <laughs> doing this, he had taken the first aerial photographer, the, the first aerial photographs in the United States. Those were of the city that he and Mumler shared, which was still Boston. Yeah, it turned out that their studios were just a couple blocks away from each other. 
And Mumler came onto Black's radar when a potential customer brought Black one of Mumler's spirit photos and asked if Black could also photograph ghosts, whether actually and authentically or through any sort of manipulative means. And Black, who was a very accomplished photographer, I mean, he was well known before those aerial photos, could not. <clears throat> and he didn't have any theories about how exactly this whole thing was being pulled off by Mumler. So he was really curious about Mumler's work and really skeptical that it, it was probably a scam. So he sent his assistant, who was named Horace Weston, to pose as a customer at Mumler's studio and see what he could find out. So not long after that, uh, Weston went back to Black and he had a portrait of himself seated near a window, and the image of his dead father was next to him. Uh, Horace Weston knew a lot about photography, and he had not seen anything in Mumler's whole process that looked like it was out of the ordinary. Um, several of Black's other employees laughed at him. Yeah, he had gone back and been like, this guy is legit, and they were like, great. Horace, are you drinking? Um, so at this point, Weston, who had been laughed at, was absolutely convinced of Mumler's authenticity. And so he went back to Mumler's studio and he explained what had just gone down, that like nobody else believed him. He tried to explain that it was real. And then he asked Mumler if Mr. Black himself could come and visit and examine how these photos were taken. And Mumler happily agreed. He had no hesitation in saying, yeah, send him over. Uh, and he especially agreed when, when Weston told him that Black was going to pay him $50 just for the chance to prove him wrong. So Black went to visit as planned. Mumler opened up their talk by saying, Mr. Black, I have heard your generous offer. All I can say is be thorough in your investigations. <clears throat> and then Mumler invited back to investigate anything involved in the entire process from the camera to the chemicals that were involved in doing the processing. But here's the thing. Black was um, conceited, to be <laughs> frank. He was so proud of his own level of knowledge, and he had a lot of corollary doubt that Mumler was anything but a bumbling amateur. And so he made a decision in this whole process that probably was the step that made him unable to figure out exactly what Mumler was doing. At one point, William Mumler said, you're welcome to take my camera apart if you want. Just you know, examine it, take it all apart, that's fine. But Black didn't think that Mumler was smart enough to manipulate uh, the mechanics of photographic equipment. And he even told him as much. And at one point during the visit, he said, you are not smart enough to put anything on that negative without my detecting it. Right? Yeah. I kind of love him because it's fun to read people, but at the same time, he shot himself in the foot on that Yeah, one. I'm, I'm annoyed at him because I'm like, not only were you real mean right there, you, you, had, you maybe could have figured it <laughs> out in that moment. <laughs> we would know now, but we don't. Anyway, uh, Black set, sat for his portrait and followed Mumler around the studio and into the dark room while the photo was being processed. And he even offered to let uh, Mumler even offered to let Black do the developing himself, which Black once again declined. Although he did watch while Mumler did it, uh, William Mumler mentioned to Black that the spirits don't always appear. Just like I said earlier, sometimes they didn't want to. Uh, but as this image developed, a second figure did appear, and it was a spirit. And James Wallace Black was convinced. He offered that promised fifty dollars to Mumler, and this, you know, self -pro uh, self professed medium wouldn't take it. And that might have been his best PR move of his entire career, because then Black went and told the whole story all over Boston. So to have Black and other photographers as well endorsing his spirit work was, of course, a huge boon for Mumler. Business continued to grow. And one thing that often comes up when these, this is discussed in, in the modern era is how, if he was in fact fleecing these people, he was able to produce these images that they were recognizing as their loved ones. And there are a few different factors that go into explaining this. So one, people were really working from memory. This was a time when there just weren't a lot of photographs floating around. So if somebody was remembering what their aunt or their brother or their, their late parent looked like, a lot of times they did not have a picture of them. Um, they were trying to remember. So if things like hair and height and build were kind of close, then their brains would fill in the details as recognizable because, you know, they might not have had another photo for comparison. They might not have seen that person in quite some time. 
And secondly, I mean, these images of spirits were kind of soft by design. They were both a little blurry and translucent, translucent often. So that same sort of fill in the blanks effect would happen for people who just really, really wanted to believe. In short, they saw what they wanted to see. They had just paid to get a spirit photograph taken and they were gonna see that. Um, <clears throat> Third, these pictures are generally pretty small. Like, I think when we talk about portraits, everybody imagines those, like, horrible portraits we all got in our senior year that are, like, 8 by 10. These are not those. They were little. Mine looks like an ad for the Wonder Years, by the way, but it's not good. It's not cute. Um, but so a lot of these were on what are called um, cartes de visite, which were essentially these little calling cards that were very, very popular at the time. They were kind of trendy. So it was hard to make out the details even of the living person that had sat for the portrait, let alone the spirit that was next to them. Eventually, though, there was a problem. In 1863, people started to recognize the images of the spirits and the photos that Mumler was taking as people who were still alive and had sat for him before. Yeah, uh, sometimes the ghosts of people who had died many years before were wearing the latest fashions. Um, one of the main people who had this experience was Dr. H.F. Gardner. And to be clear, Gardner was a spiritualist, and he had been a believer and a big supporter of Mumler's work. But after seeing a spirit in his second Mumler photograph, who he knew was a living person, uh, Gardner was then intent on exposing this photographer as a fraud. So Gardner wrote the periodical, The Banner of Light, to tell them about how Mumler's work in his second sitting with him was a deception. Although he also noted in that letter that he still believed that some of Mumler's photos were in fact real pictures of spirits. Um, this combined with other people who similarly thought that the spirits in their portraits were maybe people who were still alive, started to turn the tide against Mumler, who was plagued not only of accus with accusations of using pictures of people that had appeared in his studio previously for, for portraits of their own, but that in between someone booking their sitting and actually coming for the sitting, he might have been breaking into their houses to steal pictures of their dead relatives. <laughs> Uh, Accusations only. Yeah, that wasn't proof. But I love the idea of him as like a, a cat burglar taking pictures <laughs> so he can fake them into other pictures. It's kind of great. So Mumler started watching his business dwindle down to the point that he had to go back to engraving as his source of income. But then a few years of life in a city where people just thought he was a total fraud, that was about as much as he wanted of that. So he decided to do what anyone else in this at, that position might do, which was to run away. Uh, he didn't go into hiding, though. Uh, it was much harder to just track people everywhere they went at this time. So it was easy enough for him to just move to New York and start a spirit photography business there. <coughs> This was in 1868, and initially things in New York started out really okay. Uh, Mumler worked at the William W. Silver Gallery. He did really, really well in his first year. After less than five months there, he had taken more than 500 spirit photographs, and he had made enough money that he bought Silver out. And just a few days after he purchased the business from Silver, he was visited by a client named Joseph H. Tooker. Tucker was no ordinary client, though. He was the chief marshal of New York City, and he was there to investigate Mumler at the request of the mayor, who had heard a number of accusations against him. Tucker sat for a photo after paying Mumler for it, and then when it was developed, there was a faint figure in it, which Mumler said was Tucker's dead father-in-law, so Tucker took that picture and left and he also took some other samples of Mumler's work and one of Mumler's advertising leaflets. All of this was being gathered as evidence to charge Mumler uh, because that was definitely not his father-in-law in the photo. <laughs> Didn't look like him at all. Yeah, Tucker just, uh, to Mumler, it seemed like oh, another satisfied client out the door. He liked me so much he took a leaflet all going into evidence. <laughs> um, so soon after that, Mumler was arrested for fraud and larceny, and he was jailed in the Tombs, which was, and still is, the nickname for the Manhattan House of Detention. And on April 21st of 1869, the preliminary hearing for William Mumler began. So this hearing was really big news, and sometimes you'll see it referred to as his trial. But to be clear, it was not a trial. It was a hearing to determine if the case should go before the grand jury. It's understandable for it to be confusing, though, because this thing went on for weeks, and it was all over the papers, and it featured some big names both from a legal standpoint and from a celebrity standpoint. And that was in part because 
When Mumler was revealed as a possible fraud, it fueled a growing skepticism that had been uh, really burning pretty brightly against spiritualism. So the city of New York hired Elbridge T. Gary, who is a very high profile lawyer. If that name sounds familiar, this is not the Elbridge Gary who we talked about in our gerrymandering episode. Uh, this in, in fact is that man's grandson because history connects a bunch of different points. Um, and in hiring Gary to head this prosecution team against Mumler, the city was making a very, very clear message that this case was really all about trying the charlatanism that was so closely associated with spiritualism at this point. We are going to talk about the testimony of two particular witnesses from the hearing, but first we're going to pause for another quick sponsor break. <laughs> Abraham Bogardus, which is a name that is so spectacular, I don't want to hear anyone ever criticize it, uh, was an expert daguerreotypist and photographer, and he testified at Mumler's hearing that there were several ways in which Mumler might have created hoax photographs. And when Gary asked him how many processes there are for making spirit photos, Bogardus answered, quote, I cannot say. We may count them by scores. I can take a man with an angel over his head or with a pair of horns on his head, just as I wish. Bogardus even produced a fake spirit photo of his own and showed that it was entirely possible to produce an image of a ghost similar to what Mumler was doing. And he explained one possibility for such trickery to evade detection. He said, quote, I've made exhibits by a process not already described, produced. They are made by taking a plate and coating it in the usual way, having an impression taken by any camera out of reach or sight of the sitter, and then putting the plate back into the coating bath. It might be left, it might be left there as long as you like. And when a sitter comes, it can be used. And the first impression will appear with the figure of the sitter. This is easily done. Yeah, so he's basically describing a double process where you would pre-set the plate with an image on it and then put it in the bath. And then when the sitter came, you would act like it was a fresh, clean, unused plate and put it in the camera and take the picture. And that way you would get this, this image. Um, the other huge name that was involved in this hearing was none other than P.T. Barnum. <laughs> Uh, who had not met Mumler in person before any of this, although he did know of him and they had correspondence, and he was there to be an expert on deceit. In his opening answer to the court to state who he was and why he was there, uh, he gave his name and his address, and then he said, quote, I have devoted a portion of my life to the detection of humbugs. This whole idea cracks me up. Uh, Barnum had heard about Mumler years earlier and had written to Mumler that he intended, quote, to expose the humbug of spirit photographs. Barnum also purchased some of Mumler's work to hang in his museum, and he wrote about Mumler's work in his book, Humbugs of the World, uh, although that's such a great book title. Uh, <laughs> He never uses Mumler's name, instead just referring to him as something like the photographer the whole way through. And he concludes in the, the chapter of spirit photos by calling, calling them, quote, delusions daily practiced upon the ignorant and superstitious. Yeah, he had been pretty vocally against Mumler for a long time, saying that, like, you're taking advantage of people who are grieving, and that sucks. Um, Barnum was certainly plenty problematic in his own right, so we don't want to paint him as any sort of saint. Uh, but he was essentially there to say that he knew a deception when he saw one, and that Mumler's work was exactly that. <clears throat> and when Mumler's lawyers questioned Barnum, they brought up his expertise on such matters, citing many of the entertainer's own deceptions that he had made money off of. Uh, he denied this characterization of himself as deceitful, though. He claimed that when he was representing the Fiji mermaid as a real thing, for example, that he had believed it to be real himself, and he only found out later it was fake. Um, <laughs> At one point, he was asked, quote, have you never presented to the public matters you know to be untrue and taken money for the exhibition of spurious curiosities? In response, he said, quote, I think I may have given a little drapery with it sometimes. <laughs> uh, of course, that response elicited some laughter in the courtroom, but they were basically making a case that his testimony wasn't trustworthy because he was a known deceiver. 
Yeah, it was kind of interesting that uh, both both sides were kind of making the same case, but as evidence for themselves. It's like, you can't testify, you're deceitful. And they were like, you're an expert because you're deceitful, um, which I, <laughs> I sort of love. Uh, that photo that we mentioned earlier that was taken by Abraham Bogardus and introduced of evident, as evidence was actually a picture of P.T. Barnum. And floating to the right of Barnum's head is a ghostly version of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Uh, you can see this picture online. It's pretty cute. Uh, the photo showed how easy it really was to make a, a pretty convincing spirit photo with no ghost whatsoever involved. But uh, Mumler had a significant thing on his side in all this. The prosecution just couldn't figure out how specifically he had created the hoax images. So Bogardus had offered up some possibilities, but they couldn't prove with any certainty that any one of these specific things were what Mumler was doing. And then for Mumler's part, he stuck to his story that they were, in fact, spirit photos. He was making them by taking pictures of ghosts. And he said that he just took the pictures. It was up to the spirits whether they wanted to be in them or not. And so, on May 3rd, 1869, Justice Dowling, who presided over this hearing, made the following statement. Quote, After a careful and thorough analysis of this interesting and, I may say, extraordinary case, I have come to the conclusion that the prisoner should be discharged. I will state that, however, I am morally convinced that there may be fraud and deception practiced by this prisoner. Yet I, sitting as a magistrate to determine from the evidence given by the witnesses according to law, am compelled to decide that I would not be justified in sending this complaint to the grand jury, as, in my opinion, the prosecution has failed to make out the case. I therefore dismiss the complaint and order the discharge of the prisoner. And that was that. And since this was all tied up in the overall questions of the spiritualism movement, you might think that that would have helped them out because the charges had been dismissed. Uh, Oddly enough... (laughs) Uh, The opposition to spiritualism also thought that the wide publicity of the case and the fact that the judge said that he was personally convinced of Mumler's deceptions, uh, they thought that was a success. So the people who were for spiritualism thought they won because the charges were thrown out. The people who were against spiritualism thought they won because the judge was like, I know you're guilty. (laughs) We just can't press charges. Nobody wins. Everybody thinks they do. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and there was another pretty significant blow to Mumler's reputation two weeks after this case was concluded. The American Institute's photography section issued a statement denouncing Mumler, making it clear that he was not welcome in the New York photography community. So after uh, this hearing and then what amounted to public shaming by his entire profession, Mumler moved again, this time back to Boston. For a while, he kept taking spirit photographs in a studio that he set up in his wife Hannah's mother's house. And the demand for his work was a lot lower, but he did make his most high-profile portrait in that studio that he set up. A booking was made for a Mrs. Lindahl around 1870, but really this was an appointment for Mary Todd Lincoln. And as we mentioned earlier, she was a spiritualist. She wanted a photo of herself and her late husband, and that is exactly what William Mumler gave to her. In this photo, Mrs. Lincoln is facing directly toward the camera and then standing, uh, she's wearing all black, or what looks like all black, and a black bonnet. And then the spirit of Abraham Lincoln is behind her, just to the right, and looks to be looking down at her lovely, lovingly with his hands resting on her shoulders. You can see this on the internet. It's actually pretty cool. It is. It's a, a very sweet picture. And this photo was reproduced many times. It became a really popular souvenir. But it did not reinvigorate William Mumler's photography career. The last years of Mumler's life actually diverged completely from his life as a photographic medium. He wrote an autobiography in 1875 in which he told his side of the whole story of his work in that area. That uh, is is the one that we have referenced before. And once again, he admitted he never admitted to any kind of deceit or fraud. Um, William and Hannah, though, divorced four years after that book was published. And after they split up, he never took another picture. He died in 1884 in his early 50s. And his obituary in the Photographic Times is fascinating. It mentions that he was the inventor and treasurer of the Photoelectrotype Company, an engraver of prominence a successful photograph publisher and an inventor. His mumbler process was what enabled papers to stop using woodcuts in their news stories and instead to print actual photographs using photoelectric plates. 
The obituary also mentioned that he was working with some new technology that would let fo- that would let photographers use dry plates instead of having to wet coat the plates before use. It's only at the very end of this obituary that it says, quote, the deceased at one time gained considerable notoriety in connection with spirit photographs. Yeah, his uh, last several years of his life apparently eclipsed all of that crazy heady time <laughs> that he was really quite famous for. I, I don't know if that was just a really kind obit writer or if at that point people were like, oh, I don't want to talk about the spirit photography anymore. Uh, Mumler is still to this day considered the first spirit photographer, but he definitely was not the last, uh, particularly as photography became less and less of a specialized hobby or profession and was progressively more accessible to a wider range of enthusiasts. The number of people claiming to photograph the paranormal and supernatural grew. In some cases, as was claimed with Mumler's first photo, these images were accidental. There was an effort to take a photo of the Cumbermere Abbey in Cheshire, England, uh, and this puts Sybil Corbett on the map as a spirit photographer. Corbett had set up a camera to take this photo with an hour-long exposure, and then when the picture was developed, there was what looked to be a slightly blurred and transparent but still very present figure of a man sitting in one of the foreground chairs. And in the case of the Cumbermere image, many believe to this day that it is the ghost of Lord Combermere himself, Sybil Corbett's brother-in-law, who was recently deceased. Apparently, he was actually being interred in the hour that this photo was being taken. And while most skeptics will point out that the most obvious explanation is that during this very long exposure, some servant came in, took a seat for a second to rest, then got up to go about their duties, and that's what created this sort of ghost image. Um, Other people like to point out that believe in the photo that he was an important man and all of his servants would have been required to attend his funeral. Sybil Corbett did not try to make a career out of this as a spirit photographer. Uh, Any information on what her actual opinion was uh, is total mystery. We don't know. Um, World War I also had a pretty significant impact on the interest in spirit photography, just as was the case with the U.S. Civil War. The losses of loved ones by so many families kind of stoked the fires of hope that they could somehow see their dead again, even if it was only in a static image. And into that moment that was so filled with grief stepped photographer William Hope. And Hope, like Mumler, was offering the consolation of a photograph with a dead loved one for a price. In 1922, Hope's work had gained enough attention that he was investigated by paranormal researcher Harry Price. And Price was able to pretty quickly determine that Hope had been using two glass plates simultaneously to create his fakes. So one of the plates would already have a ghost's image on it, and the other was a clean plate that was used to capture the the live subject that was sitting for the portrait, and he would kind of stack these in the camera simultaneously so that when the image was captured, it looked for all the world like a ghost sitting or standing next to the person who was still alive. Uh, Even though Hope was exposed, he just kept doing it. He had plenty of followers who dismissed Price's findings and kept patronizing him, both as a photographer and a medium. Sometimes evidence doesn't make people believe the truth. Nope. Um, Look, we're all on the same page here. We all know what's going on, okay? We all know. Um... In 1936, there was another mysteriously haunted photo that was taken in Norfolk, England. And in this case, there were two men involved, uh, Captain Hubert Provand and Indra Shira, who was Provand's assistant. And these two were working for Country Life magazine, and they were there on a sa- assignment at Raynham Hall taking pictures of this beautiful estate. So they were getting ready to take a photo of the building's main staircase, and Indra Shira saw what he described as a vapory form that slowly took on the features of a woman floating down the stairs. And Shira ex- exclaimed in shock. And then Pravan, who was under the camera's cloth, jumped and snapped the photo and then captured an image of a ghost in the process. And the magazine published this photograph because why would you not? Uh, and of course, it was a sensation. Raynham Hall kind of already had its own ghost lore attached to it, specifically that it was haunted by Lady Dorothy Townsend. And Lady Townsend was the sister of Robert Walpole, and she had died at Raynham Hall in 1726. Her legend involves a possible adulterous affair and being held there at the hall while the outside world was told that she was dead as a punishment for that affair. Um, All of the reality of this is super blurry in the historical record. I'm just telling you, like, the mythology that fed this picture's popularity. Um, 
so yeah, we don't have evidence, but it sure makes a really good story that supports the idea that this is a ghost picture. And a lot of the magazine's readers believed that clearly Provand and Shira had managed to get a picture of Lady Townsend. Once again, Harry Price was on the case. He opened an investigation into the so-called Brown Lady of Raynham Hall, named so because she was allegedly wearing a brown brocade dress when her picture was taken. And then unlike his work uncovering Hope's fraudulent photos, Price couldn't find evidence of specific trickery or foul play on Provand and Shira's parts. Uh, He wrote of this investigation, quote, I could not shake their story and I had no right to disbelieve them. Only collusion between the two men would account for the ghost if it is a fake. The negative is entirely innocent of any faking. And Price's word carried some significant weight, but there were still a lot of skeptics who did not believe that the Raynham Hall photo contained an actual ghost. And in 1937, the year following the picture's publication and its huge surge in popularity, the Society for Psychical Research determined that the ghost that was captured was actually just the result of the camera being shaken during uh, the six-second exposure at some point. So, no, they were not being deceitful, but they also did not take a picture of a ghost. Yeah. Maybe when he cried out an alarm yes. and he jumped. <laughs> it was that, maybe I, that I was can't it. imagine that would shake the, the <laughs> camera. What? I don't... But here's the thing, though, going back to Mumler. Looking at this Mary Todd Lincoln portrait and the other photos, it becomes really apparent that even if you think he was a fraud, he was taking a lot, he was taking a lot of care in how these images were composed. And he probably did give a lot of people some comfort through his work. Uh, this stands in a lot of contrast to William Hope, who, for example, had photos that were like way less finessed. Sometimes they looked like really sloppy collages or like he had kind of scratched the negative to make a spiritual presence with no form there. Whether he was a fraud or legitimate, Mumler was a much better artist when it came to the composition. I mean, like we said earlier, a lot of these photos you can see online, they're really lovely. Yeah, they're, in some cases, that Mary Todd Lincoln image is actually quite moving. It's really beautiful. Um, but the thing that remains unknown to this day is exactly how William Mumler was taking these spirit photos. He may have had a previously prepared glass plate sitting in front of an unused plate in his camera, one of the ways that we've talked about this being done, so that when he took that image of the client, it also captured the ghost. But he also could have used any one of the methods that Abraham Bogardus had described during Mumler's legal hearing. But nobody really knows. Yeah, it's all speculation. And it's part of why Mumler continues to fascinate a lot of people and why his case is used as evidence both by skeptics who think that the photos are obviously fake and by believers who point out that their creation is still a mystery. So that is William Mumler, spirit photographer and history mystery. We really cannot, cannot, I cannot stress this enough, thank the staff at Park West enough for their hospitality and their incredible level of organization. We felt so pampered while we were there, and that building is really cool. Yeah, they were absolutely great. And if you would like to come to one of our live shows, we have good news. If you are in Texas, we will be touring there starting November 14th, 2019. And you can get more information if you go to our website, click on where it says live shows at the top of the page, or just go to mistinhistory.com slash shows. And then I think, Holly, to close us out, you have some listener mail. I do. It's a, This is a longish episode, so it's a, a quick one. And this is from our listener, uh, Catlin. I think that is what she goes by. She says, to start, thank you guys for all the things I get to learn by listening to your entertaining podcast. I'm emailing after the Robert Liston episode because it just so happened to be released the same day that my little kitten went to the vet to amputate his nub. He was born without a paw on his right back leg, causing it to grow a bit weird, and it usually stuck out from his side like a chicken wing. Uh, she goes on to describe a little bit more of it, but basically uh, she she had to, they had to have a little surgery for it. She said, your episode was a nice thing to tell me that this guy had it down way back when and taught others to do well also. And that gave me a little extra confidence that the technique for the tiny kitty would be geared for helping him too. Uh, she also attached pictures of this incredibly weaponized level cute cat <laughs> for which we thank her. I'm so glad he's doing well and that his surgery went well. I have said many times on the podcast, my hat is always off to veterinarians for the work they do because uh, they are learning to deal with many species, not just one human species, like a human doctor, which is also no shade to human doctors, but it's a lot of work and I think they don't always get enough credit. So uh, I am so glad your kitten is doing well. And again, always happy for a chance to shout out the awesomeness of veterinarians. Uh, If you would like to write to us, you can do so at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. You can also find us everywhere on social media as Missed in History. 
And that webpage that Tracy mentioned a bit ago is mistinhistory.com. So come and check us out there. Check out live show information. You can also subscribe to the podcast. That's something we delight in and encourage. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app at Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 